right, so welcome to the final PRAC um, for this course. So today we're going through the 2014 past paper. Um, we're going to start from the back of the paper and work our way through uh, because we, we didn't get um, too much time to talk about the essay questions when we did the 2012 uh, paper. So we'll start um, with question seven, which is the um, question that looks at the enforcement um, guidelines, and then we'll work backwards from that. Alrighty, everyone. Let's start with um, the last question on the 2014 paper. So we'll start at the back, and we'll work our way to the front. So you'll see that, um, you'll remember you get a choice of two out of three essay questions. So you'll get to make a call during the exam whether you are going to do the enforcement um, response question, whether you're going to do a one about a major project or whether you're going to do one about mining. So you'll know that you'll have a choice of two out of three from those topics. Um, and as you also would have gathered by now, you can come in with a sense of what you want your model answer to look like, um, you know, how you're going to sort of set it out in terms of describing different processes. Um, so if we look at question seven, it's very similar to what we saw in the 2012 paper. It's just a different factual scenario. Um, so this one is saying you're employed by the Queensland Department of Environment and Heritage Protection in Townsville as an environmental officer. Your responsibilities include enforcement of the Environmental Protection Act. Cyclone Ito has caused heavy rain in the region in early 2014 and a large volume of water was released from tailings dams for toxic waste at the Yabula Nickel Refinery, located north of Townsville and operated by Queensland Nickel. DEHB inspectors found water from the tailings dam was spilling into local waterways that flow to the nearby Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. Then it lists out the different discretionary powers that the EPA um, has or under the Environmental Protection Act and how they can respond. And then afterwards it says, advise your manager on the appropriate enforcement action to take, if any. Your answer should explain the reasons for your recommendation for or against choosing each of the enforcement options listed above, and your reasons should be based on the department's enforcement guidelines. So obviously you, make, you need to make sure you've got those enforcement guidelines with you in the exam, and you're going to structure your answer according to the structure of those enforcement guidelines. Um, it's a good idea to use headings as you're, as you're answering these questions and, um, you know, to sort of try and keep it clear as you're going from one step to the next. So what are the key facts here? What are the things that we need to be looking at in those facts to decide what enforcement action to take? a contaminant, so that the nature of the thing that was released. Yeah. Okay. What else? If there are any precautions taken to stop it from happening. Okay, if there are any precautions taken. What else? Yeah, something something more vital. Remember the tables that you have to look at in the enforcement guidelines? What are you looking at? serious the impact is on the environment. Right. So you need to understand the, the impact and the nature of the receiving environment. So how sensitive is the receiving environment to what was being released? And where does the local waterway flow to? Great the nearby Great Barrier Reef World Heritage Area. Okay, so, so you know that the thing that is spilling out is, is 
heavily polluted, so it's got the risk there of causing serious environmental harm, and you know that it's flowing into a very sensitive receiving environment. Okay, so the facts that you were getting there were, were pointing you in a very particular direction in terms of highlighting that there could be serious harm, it's a very sensitive environment, but you would obviously be pointing out here that what you don't have is information on the actual harm caused or all of the circumstances behind how that release um, took place and, and, and what reaction there was to contain it and so on. So at this point what you can see is um, there's nothing in the facts that's telling you that immediate action was taken to contain the release. You know, in, in the one we looked at last time, it, it showed it was accidental and that all of the cleanup procedures were immediately followed and so on. This isn't in your facts, which um, means that when you're using that, that critical thinking, that insight, you can point out that, um, that that probably means that cleanup action has not been taken. It, it tells you, in fact, that the inspectors have found um, that water is spilling into the local waterways, so factually it's telling you it's still happening. And that's going to influence your decision in terms of deciding what enforcement action to take, because remember, you've got to think about what's the purpose of this enforcement action. So in this case, the purpose behind the enforcement action is to stop that uh, release from the tailings dam and to you know, contain and remediate. So what that means is you would obviously go through all the different options, um, but clearly you need more investigation of the, the harm that's being caused and some sort of clean up notice is probably the most logical choice here because it's then containing the contaminant and it's doing something to address the, um, the possibility of serious harm. If you, if you have a look and you look at C, it says that you can issue a clean-up notice requiring them to prevent or minimize contamination, to rehabilitate or restore, um, to assess the nature and extent of the environmental harm um, from the incident, including inspecting, sampling, recording, measuring, um, and to keep the department informed about the incident and any actions taken under the notice. So is there any... Yep. Can you issue a clean-up notice and also find them? Or is it like pick one? You would, because, remember, you would need to know the extent of the harm to then determine the extent of the penalty. Okay. So, and you could certainly point that out in your answer, that further action may then, you know, once that investigation is completed, once the incident has been properly assessed, and contained because you know that containment is the priority. Once that's done, then you would recommend the department um, re revisited it and considered whether the penalties or, in fact, um, you know, proceedings should be taken, depending on the level of fault. Because that's the thing we don't know, do we? we? Don't know the level of fault, and we don't know the level of harm. So that's why we want to investigate. At what level Remember, it's, remember, there's that financial component to it. So it goes. So there's those thresholds of the, the dollar figure that you can present in terms of how much harm is caused, how much it costs to clean it up. So that's one factor you can look at. Okay. Yeah. It's more about showing that you're considering these, the options and you're applying them to the facts as you know them or you're highlighting the additional information that you would need. So it's, it's again, it's not that idea of you know, technical perfection, it's more that analysis around it. In this case, when we're answering this question, do we have to give it through your A's through to F and yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, remember, so it says in the question, 
Yeah. Your answer should explain the reasons for your recommendations for or against choosing each of the enforcement options. Yeah, make sure you do that because you'll, you'll miss out on a lot of marks if you don't go through each one. Yeah. And so, for example, you would say, you know, taking no action. Well, there's a real threat to the environment here, so this would not be um, you know, a recommended course of action. Next one, writing a warning letter. Well, this is something that would take time to process and we would need a more immediate response to the incident. So you sort of go through, yeah. All right, should we look at the mining one next? So question six, so we're, we're going backwards to question six. We've got an extrata coal mine. So it says you act for extrata, the world's largest exporter of seaborne thermal coal used to generate electricity. It proposes to construct the Wandoan coal mine near the town of Wandoan, 350 kilometers northwest of Brisbane in the Surat Basin. The mine is proposed to produce approximately 900 million tonnes of product coal over a 30-year life of mine. Assuming an average price for thermal coal of $100 a tonne, the gross value of the product coal is Australian $90 billion. The mine will be comprised of 14 pits, several of which are 25 kilometres squared in area and 70 metres deep, see figure two. The coal will be transported by rail to Gladstone for export to predominantly Asian markets. Um, the land on which the mine is proposed is currently used for cattle grazing. Its strata has pur purchased the pastoral leases covering the majority of the proposed mine. It currently holds an exploration permit covering the land. Local landholders are concerned about the mine's impacts on groundwater and conservation groups allege the mine will contribute to climate change. Advise your client on the major mining and environmental approvals that it may need to obtain for the proposed mine, any opportunities that surrounding landholders or others may have to object to it, how the mine is assessed by the government, and what controls are likely to apply to the mine if it is approved. If further information is needed to know what approvals are required, explain what that information is. Also advise your client on any statutory processes that it may apply for to give the project special status and to facilitate the assessment and approval of the mine. Explain the practical benefits that any such processes may have for the mine. Now this is 20 marks and it says allow up to 40 minutes to answer the question. Now what you will see is in those last two paragraphs there are a lot of sub-questions that you specifically have to answer. So in the exam you would make sure that you numbered each of them, right, so that you're clear that you've ticked them all off and make sure you've got a heading for each one as you go so it's very clear to the marker that you have addressed each of those dot points. Um, now. The way, it's very similar to the questions where you look at major projects. So it's the same idea. You can write up your own summary of the mining approvals and the EPBC Act as they would apply to mines. Um, and then you can bring that summary in with you and modify it for the particular facts um, that you're going to see in the exam. Um, so, so what sort of things do you think you'd want to be talking about when you talk about the mining approvals? which pieces of legislation would apply. I'm stretching your memories here. <laughs> like mining? Mining was a long time ago. Do you think you'd do this question in the exam? No. No. So you'd go major projects and you'd go um, enforcement guidelines. Because you have to do two. So if you decide you're not going to do mining, it means you'd have to do the other two. Those are the three options. Yeah, and it's in the information for the exam mm -hmm. that those are your three options. Yeah, we're very kind. But it, you know, obviously, if you think you're going to do the mining question, you need to have that summary ready to go. Okay, so you need to remember the Mineral Resources Act is going to apply, right, for a mine. Um, so we're going to need a mining lease under the Mineral Resources Act. So you'd need to talk about the, all the requirements there for getting approval under the Mineral Resources Act. And they also need to hold an environmental authority under the Environmental Protection Act. So you would go through and talk about all the requirements there. How are mines assessed? What would they probably go through? How are the impacts from mines assessed? 
EIS, okay, so you want to talk about the fact that an EIS would probably be required, you talk about the processes for an EIS. And you'll need to talk about the criteria that would apply when they assess um, the application for both the, the mining lease and the environmental authority. So remember the standard criteria that we talked about. And what about, um, what was the question? Where is it on? Uh, what about opportunities for landholders or others to object to it? No, it's not subjective at all. Purely, it's incredibly procedural. <coughs> So remember, they have to have made a public submission in order to have standing to then bring an objections hearing in the land court. So if they haven't made a public submission, then they don't have standing to bring an objection. And what about the statutory processes that the miner could apply for to give the project special status? talked about it in the lecture last week. Try and come to the lecture on Friday because I'll go through and talk about the key points of each topic. Mm. Any ideas? So, yeah, yeah, so it can be a coordinated project. Yeah. Under what act? Uh, what's the acronym? SDPWO. Yep, so make sure you know the full <laughs> name. <laughs> Only for your own purposes so you understand what you're then talking about when you look at the other slides I have and what it means. So that's the State Development and Public Works Organization Act just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? <laughs> and then what other piece of legislation do you need to talk about? EPBC Act. Okay, so you need to go through and discuss the processes under the EPBC Act, so you need to discuss the different matters of national environmental significance. Certainly for something like this, you, you need to be showing that you understand the different matters. So you would want to be like listing dot them. Points. Dot points is fine, but you, would need, you need to be listing them yeah. because you might not have enough facts to be able to identify all of the matters of national environmental significance. So what you're doing is you're saying, yes, I understand, because not everyone does understand that it's only when those things are triggered that are matters of national <coughs> environmental significance that the EPBC Act applies. So if you don't list those things, then you're not distinguishing yourself from the students that go, yeah, EPBC Act, but then they haven't got an explanation for why they're talking about the EPBC Act. So it's not one of those things where you just throw your eggs in one basket and hope that <laughs> it sticks. You have to sort of explain, well, why are you discussing the EPBC Act? What's the, you know, have you actually cottoned on to why you need to talk about it? And then you'll need to talk about the processes under the EPBC Act, so the process for referral, the process for assessment, and the process for approval. Wouldn't all mining activities be considered a matter of national environment? 
No. Only, so it's dependent on where it is? It's dependent on where it is. It's dependent on what it interferes with. It's dependent on groundwater impacts. So remember, there's a trigger for groundwater, but not all mines are going to have groundwater impacts. Okay. And remember, it has to be likely to have a significant impact on those matters of national environmental significance. So, um, so yes, not all coal mines will, will trigger the EPBC Act. And then the last thing you'd want to talk about is the interrelationship between what happens with the state approvals and the EPBC Act, so the fact that we've got these bilateral agreements for the assessment process. Okay, so that's the mining question. Just, just um, for your information, when you're in the exam, you probably don't even notice this. This is just something that Chris McGrath has done on, over the years. Is every single one of these examples is a real life example. So it's a real site layout plan for a mine. The facts are all accurate. As I found out when I sat down to write the paper, <laughs> I had to then go and find exact layouts, and it's that everything is real scenarios. Um, so. You know, if you have a moment to chuckle to yourself, you can enjoy the fact that I went for a lot of effort to give you real examples in your favour. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. <laughs> All right, let's look at question five. So this is your sort of major projects question. It's going to be something to do with the major developments. You can have your model answer ready to go. So this is... So this is Pandanus, owns land, it wants to develop as a caravan park at Ewell Point near Port Douglas in North Queensland. The land is described as, and there's your lot in SR, hectares, close to a beach, um, 66 cabins, 40 powered caravan sites, um, powered camping sites, unpowered camping sites, a pool, a barbecue, office block, manager's house, amenities, toilet blocks, two storage sheds, see figure one. As I said before, that's a real, a real example of the actual proposal. It says the western half of the land was previously cleared for a sugarcane farm that is now abandoned. The eastern half of the land is covered by native vegetation and mangroves. The eastern boundary borders a national park that is part of the wet tropics wet heritage area and neighbouring landholders oppose the proposal. And it says... Advise your client on the major planning and environmental approvals that it may need to obtain to undertake the proposed development and any opportunities that the neighbours may have to object to it. If further information is needed to know what approvals are required, explain what that information is. It's 20 marks. It says allow up to 40 minutes to answer this question. So... Um, So this, again, is one of those ones where you want to come in with your model answer, um, and you need to be talking about this, the Sustainable Planning Act about three quarters of your time, and then the EPBC Act for about a quarter of your time. That's the way the marks will be allocated, so about three quarters of the marks to the processes under the Sustainable Planning Act, and about a quarter of the marks will go to your discussion of the EPBC Act. Um, and if you're not sure where to start, start with your handouts. So, for example, um, you know, start with the one that you were given about the IDAS system. So you had your flow chart that you were given on um, the IDAS system and how it works. It gives you all the different categories of um, development. So it talks about um, exempt development, self-accessible, and so on and so forth. Um, so you, you would want to, first of all, you want to talk about the different types of development. So that's the stuff at the top. You know, you want to talk about material change of use. You want to talk about operational works and so on and so forth. Um, then you want to talk about your categories. Um, and then you're going to talk about, um, you know, how do you decide what the assessment process is? So where do you look? Um, and that's when you would be pointing out the additional information that you would need to know in order to um, find out what the assessment was 
um, for the different types of development. Um, and yeah, this is basic, this sort of handout basically it's going to take you step by step through that. And um, then the other one that you've got, the other handout that's really useful is the one that points out the different EIS processes. So this is the one that's got all the different flowcharts for you that explain the different EIS processes under the different pieces of legislation. So that's another really good one to use. Um, and you can structure your answer in terms of following the way the processes go. So the, you know, the, the, when the development application is made, the information request, public notification if it's going through EIS, um, um, you know, the, the fact that public submissions could be made during the public notification period. And, and of course, you need to make sure you talk about the potential for appeals. So the fact that these things can be, these decisions can be appealed. And then for the EPBC Act, um, you've got a handout for that one as well. So you've got, um, you've got this handout here that talks about the EPBC Act. Again, it goes through the different processes. It's talking about the different sections that apply for each of the uh, matters of national environmental significance and so on. Okay. Um, and so that's, again, that's how you would be structuring your answer. So uh, make, make use of the handouts that were, sort of, that were there to help guide you through this process of coming up with your, your model answer. And as I said in when we did the 2012 exam, it's completely okay to work in small groups and use your, your peers around you to come up with a good model answer. Um, because when you get into the exam, you are all going to have to then modify it to the facts that you've been given in the question. So you'll end up making it original to yourself because you need to keep referring it back to the facts that you've been given. So you'll, you'll all end up with different, different looking answers anyway. So, so that's completely okay to do that. Are there any questions on that one, or should we keep keep going? Like, do you treat the proposal as I don't know, like one whole? In other words, like being that it's built over different types of areas, like native vegetation, an abandoned farm, you know, border park, whatever, whatever. Do you treat the little like sub areas of the proposal under the different sort of? If you believe that's going to change the IDAS process. Split. Would it change the IDAS process? <laughs> Look into it. <laughs> Remember, this is the IDAS process, not. Yeah. Yeah. But certainly, once you sort of, let's say, for example, you were talking about the different types of development. Okay, so you might talk about subdivisions and you might talk about, so reconfiguring a lot, and you might talk about the operational works and you might talk about the building works. That might be the point where you point out that these are for different aspects of the build. Yeah. Mm. And so, you know, that the operational works on particular areas of vegetation might have a different level of assessment. Yeah. Just don't sort of get too fragmented. Try and keep it because you are being marked on how you're presenting that argument, you know, that flow. Yeah. Okay, question four. Let's look at question four. You act as a consultant advising a company on the redevelopment of an old industrial area into a residential estate. The market value of the redeveloped site is expected to be uh, well over 250 million, but the development requires extensive remediation of contaminated land. Explain your professional duties and ethical obligations in the following situations. You've got three sub questions there. It's worth five marks for all of them, and it says to allow about ten minutes to answer these questions. So keep your, keep your eye on the time when you're doing these questions, because you know you've got the essays ahead of you, and any more time that you spend on these, um, you're going to be eating into your time for the essay questions. So just be quite, try and be quite strict with yourself about how you're doing for time, um, because as soon as you start eating into your time for the essay, you're eating into the bigger marks that are coming there. Oh, I don't know. I mean, it depends on whether you're the type of person that likes to get everything else under your belt and say, okay, I've done all the 
the itty bitty bits and now I can just focus my mind just on these essays. You know, everyone's different. So it's more about time management than it is about the order you do them in. So the advice from Chris has always been stick to that time. And, and don't skip any questions. As soon as you skip a question, you're then taking away the opportunity to get 50, a minimum of 50% of those marks. So you're putting yourself at a dis disadvantage. So move through them all, you know, giving it your best first go type thing. Yeah. yeah. I just, I'm thinking of like, <laughs> I don't ever handwrite anything. Oh, and that's why I've been saying for weeks now, when you get into swap back, stop using the computer to type your notes and start handwriting. Build up, it's, you know, just doing it across the course of that, that week of study will build up the muscles and speed you, speed you up. But, you know, you, you'd need to plan ahead and say, right, I need to, you know, that's something I need to work on because you will be slow. And, and you also need to make sure your handwriting is able to be read, you know. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the sub-questions. <laughs> okay, A, you're concerned about ongoing contamination of the site, but your client is unwilling to provide you with any reports from a suitably qualified expert showing the site is no longer contaminated. Uh, B, an investigator from the Queensland Department of Environment and Heritage um, asks you about contamination of the site after your client has instructed you not to discuss the issue with anyone. Uh, C, an investigator is causing considerable delays in the project by requesting further site testing and remediation work be carried out. As you get on well with the investigator, your client wants you to ask if they would be interested in a job with the project and a salary way above what they are currently earning. Okay, let's, let's talk about A. You're concerned about ongoing contamination of the site, but your client is unwilling to provide you with any reports showing the site is no longer contaminated. Okay, so you would need your handouts that were from last week's lecture. Okay, so the ones about professional duties. And can you think back to the lecture and tell me which, which duty is or which duties are applicable to this question? duty to take reasonable care. Excellent. Can you apply that to the facts for me? Can you sort of combine the two? Well, you need to have the facts that you're not contaminating the site, otherwise you could be being negligent. Yes. yes. So you've got a duty to take reasonable care, right? which means avoiding negligence, which means that you need to be ideally addressing the contamination issues fully in your report. Um, what do you do if your client does not, does not wish for you to go ahead and do that? What are your options then? What would the report say? What if the report said nothing about contamination? What impression does that give? That, there is none. that, that there is none, so it's misleading. So you're then misleading the public if the report says nothing about contamination or if it in any way implies that the contamination issues are not there on the site. So you would need to make sure that the report has a statement in it pointing out the limits of the work that have been done. And the other thing that you would be doing here, because the other issue that comes into this is breach of contract, is you need to 
clearly document what you advised your client and their response and the fact that they have then instructed you not to look at the contamination issues. So they don't then come back and say that you're in breach of contract because you didn't, you didn't do what you were engaged to do, which is to provide a full report looking at all of the environmental aspects. So that's A. <laughs> Let's move on to B. Okay. So this is the investigator has asked you about contamination of the site after your client has instructed you not to discuss this issue with anyone. So which of the duties is relevant here? So there's a duty of confidentiality. But something else you said was to always cooperate with. Oh no, that's only if there's a, a skill. That's only your client that has to cooperate. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So can you see that this question is it's very specifically designed to put you right in the middle of an ethical dilemma between your honesty and your assistance to the department in giving them a full and frank disclosure of the nature of the site based on your expertise versus your professional duty to your client, which is a duty of confidentiality. So what do you think you would do in this case? So you could, that, that's a good idea, so you could try talking to your client and, and point out to them the importance of cooperating with the department, that there could be ramifications down the track if they're, they're found to have failed to address environmental issues on the site, or they've kept silent about it, so you could talk about their duty to notify the department, so you could try and talk them around that way. That doesn't get you out of your duty of confidentiality. But, you, but certainly that's an option. Um, so your, your, your duty of confidentiality s is still there, isn't it? You're still obliged to maintain that duty of confidentiality. What could you say to the department? Well, you're not, you're not, you don't have a conflict of interest. No, but that you have one with your client. Well, no, you don't have a conflict of interest. Can you tell them to go directly to the client? So what you need, so what you can do is, without breaching your duty of confidentiality, you can tell them that you've been instructed not to discuss it with them. So you're then not breaching your duty of confidentiality because you're not disclosing anything at all. You're just making it clear that you're not in a position to discuss it with them because of your client's instructions. And as you say, you could then suggest that they go direct to your client. Now, you would probably lose your client as a result of doing that because they're paying you to act as the go-between and to kind of keep the, the, the heat from them. Um, and one of the things that would be very important in this situation is that you document everything very carefully, that you document the discussions you had with your client where you encourage them um, you know, to disclose this to the department and where they clearly instructed you not to. And whatever you say to the department, you would have to clearly document that as well so you didn't then find yourself being sued for a breach of confidentiality. Good old pen and paper. <laughs> yeah. 
We, so in, the first thing they introduce you to in a law firm is a diary notepad, is what they call it, and it's to document every meeting. Everything that's said in any phone call or any meeting all gets handwritten up. And ideally, you sign it at the bottom, so it's, then it's, it's a statement that can be relied on in court. Yeah. And that's why you find consultants, like environmental consultants, they always carry those those bound sort of diary type things around with them and they sit and they write a little note of what their meeting was with their client. It's the same sort of concept. So um, you have to have made the note almost immediately at the time of the meeting. So either during the meeting or immediately after in order for it to be considered a, a complete, um, you know, reliable record of what, what took place. And why is writing it down better than typing? Typing can, typing can be edited. So you then can't prove that that was written on that date and not, not subsequently edited to suit your purposes or anything like that. If it's a handwritten note, um, you know, dated and so on, then there's no, no question. Yeah. Third one. The third one, um, D E H P, something else that just rolls off the tongue. Uh, investigators causing considerable <coughs> delays in the project by requesting further site testing and remediation work be carried out. As you get on well with the investigator, your client wants you to ask if they would be interested in a job with the project and a salary way above what they are currently earning. Okay, what was the other thing we talked about in the lecture on Friday? See, we're pretty much going through these things one by one. What was the other thing? Remember, we talked about the lady in the council who was assessing planning applications. Bribery, Bribery slash corruption. Yeah. Okay. So professionals have a duty not to engage in corruption. Does bribe is bribery corruption? Yeah. Okay. So. Remember, even the fact that you're not the one who's actually going to end up giving them the, the benefit, the financial benefit of the job, you're still procuring it, you're making the promise and you're being a party to it, so you would still be liable um, for uh, corruption. Okay, so what would you be suggesting is the best course of action here? Are you going to say yes to your client? No, I, d I hope not. <laughs> you would say no, and again, you would document it. You would make sure you'd made a note of the fact that you had clearly refused in case this came back to bite you down the track. So you'd want to make, make it clear because, of course, you've then been put on notice. The fact they've come to you and suggested this is their course of action means you're on notice that it's what they're intending to do, so you would need to document something that means you've pointed out to them that corruption is a crime, that they shouldn't be offering bribes to public officials, and that you declined to play, be a party to, um, to their plans. And we are not making this stuff up. I know you <laughs> this, is, this happens. That's why it's important that you, you know, given time to think it through before you get out there. All right, so the, the other questions are all very similar to the ones we did um, it, for the 2012 exam. Um, so I won't, I won't go through those because we're, we're pretty much running out of time. Um, yeah, the whole they're all very similar. These were the main ones I wanted to make sure that we got through. Did you guys have any other questions? So we've done the enforcement guidelines question. We've done the mining project essay question. And we've done the major projects. And we've looked at the professional duties questions. And then we've got the review lecture on Friday, where we'll go through and we'll just summarise the, the key points from each of the topics. How long would you be expecting essays to be? Like, 
Yeah, we don't we don't we don't give a suggestion of word length and that's really because um, if I can use the group assignments as an example, the longer assignments were not necessarily the better assignments. Um, and there were some shorter assignments that just managed to kick all the points very succinctly. Um, and so if we say to you, oh, you know, two pages or three pages or whatever the, what we say, it's going to be misleading because some people are going to go, ah, I've, made, I've reached my two pages, I'll stop. But they won't necessarily have, by that point, applied the law back to the facts. They might only have just described the law but not applied it. And so, yeah, so we don't give suggested word lens. And, you know, some people have big handwriting, some people have tiny little writing, some people will use dot points and headings and others will just cram it all in. I suggest you use the headings and the dot points and make it easier for your marker <laughs> to, to read it. Um, but, you know, so, yeah. Can we um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I've read, I've read papers in the past where students have gone through with like a coloured pen and underlined bits and highlighted bits. It's very distracting um, because it won't necessarily be the thing I'm looking for for the marks. It's a sort of drawing my eye away from what might be a good, yeah. But headings are definitely really useful because you're showing, yes, I've talked about this part, yes, I've talked about that part. And it helps you to gather your thoughts and go, okay, under this heading, I'm going to make sure I dis properly discuss this section and apply it back to the facts. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any other questions? No. Well, thank you for coming, and thank you for coming all semester. It's been an absolute pleasure to teach you all. I'm a little bit sad that the course is coming to an end, so... <laughs> Um, so I'll see, I'll, I'll see you guys in the lecture, and, um, and yeah, I hope you all do very well on the exam. So good luck.